I just wanted to tell you today about a field called neurobotics. So you probably have heard of a field called neuroscience, and you probably have heard of a field called robotics. Um, but what I'm trying to do is to merge those two things together and even create one word, neurobotics. Um, and this is a field I've helped create about 10 years ago, and it's just catching like wildfire. Um, and um, just, you know, just to give you a very intuitive feel about what neurobotics is, I'm going to get you a, sort of a quick example. So you probably know somebody who is on a wheelchair, maybe paralyzed from the neck down, um, or maybe you know, have some freedom with the arms but not the legs. Um, those people have spinal cord injury, and they have very healthy brain, but because the spine is broken somewhere that disconnected the nerve connection, to control the limbs, as we freely sometimes do, um, they, they, just, they, they want to move it, but the limbs are not responding. So the, you know, the future idea would be that we put them some sort of a little jumpsuit and zip it up, which is made of a robotic device. We connect the wire, the, the thoughts that control the movements. You know, as we think about moving this, we can move them. We, so we maybe wirelessly or with wired connect that onto the robotic wearable device. And as we think of moving our limbs, now we extract that signal, process it, and then control the robotic device, so now we can start to control those paralyzed limbs. Okay, so that's sort of the general global idea of what neurobotics is. And I just wanted to show you, well, where did I even get that idea from? Why did I even start a field called neurobotics? I was a passionate tennis player. That's really where I started. I grew up in Japan, and all I wanted to do was to play tennis all my life. And I came to the U.S. with an American dream of becoming this number one tennis player. But turned out, as I was playing in college, I kept getting injured all the time, you know, just playing, trying to hit a backhand, and I would sprain my ankle. I would do so many things to the point that my ranking kept going down, and I thought, well, maybe I should think about something else to do. So um, that's when I decided that, you know, I'm going to use my math skill and build my tennis buddy. So, my tennis buddy that I can play tennis with, you know, if you play tennis or in individual sports, you know you like to have a partner who's just about your level or just a little bit better than you, who pushes you to the right level. If they're not as good as you by a big, you know, long shot, it's just not fun. And if it's the other way around, they're not probably having fun. So I wanted to build something that was just at the right level, and depending on the day, if I'm tired or whatever, I can just tune the knob just a little bit and having human-level intelligence and human-level capabilities of running around a tennis court so that we can play tennis together. Um, so I knocked on some doors, including Disney Imagineering. At that time, they said, come back with 10 more years of robotic experience, so go away. But, um, you know, here I am. Maybe they'll hire me. Um, so, um, so to build this tennis buddy, I've um, started at the UC Berkeley. That's where I did my undergraduate degree. And I worked in a lab where they were building robotic legs. Um, after I've felt that I've mastered legs, I've gone on to MIT to um, still keep pushing through this idea of building a very human-like robot. So this is a robot called COG that was built at MIT, upper torso um, ro uh, robotic system, which we tried to replicate a two-year-old intelligence into robotic form. I was in charge of the arms and, um, and hands, and for the hand, we got to a point where we replicated human-like reflex, just like babies. They're born with reflex. You touch their fingers and they curl, if you remember, and then you tickle or do something, and then they open up. Um, we hardwire those information on the robotic side and then let the robot learn how to manipulate different objects in the world. And within about two years' time, actually even within about a few weeks in a robotic scale, it got to a point where this robotic hand, I could just walk around on a wood stick and could grab almost anything in a lab as long as it was about the right size and right shape. So it was really dramatic. We could make the computer robot to learn to do things just like how babies can learn to do things. However, I've reached sort of a limit. Um, you know, so we grab objects most of the time, we use hands for that, but we do a whole lot more than that. We manipulate objects, we're so good with our hands, and a lot of people blame that our hands are the reasons why we have this society. You know, we, we can use tools, we can build buildings, we can even have this level of consciousness, some people believe, because we gather information using our amazing sensory information from our hand and manipulate objects in an intricate way that other primates don't do. So I wanted to build that into the robot, you know, but there is no way to do it. It's still difficult to do it. 
And I realized that maybe the right place to start is not in the field of robotics, but in the field of neuroscience. So halfway through my actually program at MIT, I just decided to completely switch my field and study neuroscience. And um, learned a whole lot more about human、um, brain and how it works. And then I tried to then integrate back in the information I learned in neuroscience to improve the robotic system. But by the time I learned neuroscience, it was so fascinating how human brain works. And also, I've learned that there's so many people who have neurological disorders who could be helped quite a lot by the robotic technology that we already have. So I've shifted from building my tennis buddy interest, which I still have a little bit of, to、um, to really trying to see if we can combine neuroscience and robotics in such a way that we end up helping people. Who have neurological disorders or maybe physical disabilities, so that they can move better. So that's really what we're after. We want to build a mechanical device that's controlled by the original brain signals, and then that would mimic as if you know it's our own limb, and then nobody else could tell that it's actually a robotic device. That's really our ultimate goal at this moment. So where are we in the field of neurobotics? Well, we have one exactly one company. That's really pursuing this idea with humans, and it's in a very primitive stage. This is a company in Connecticut、uh, called Cyberkinetics. They had two human subjects so far, one successful, one not, and the one successful smiling patient is shown here. And the idea is that we can't get to this really intricate movement yet, but maybe we can get to a point where we can put a chip on the brain surface, and then extract information. As people are thinking about moving a cursor on a computer screen up, down, or left and right. Now, if we could do that for patients who cannot move anything on their body at all, not even blink, then we now gave them a freedom to communicate to the external world using their healthy brain by moving the cursor up and down to choose letters such as, you know, maybe type on the keyboard or on the computer screen, or even just have big buttons, yes and no, on the left and right. And then, if we can ask them and says, "Are you in pain?" and if they can say yes, that's so much more improvement than what they have. They are really locked in. They have healthy brain inside with no ability to move. There is a lot of disease like that out there. So this company is really trying to do that. And this is really the level of where neurobotics is for human trials. Okay, but it's starting. It's really exciting.、Um, but so,、um, but so, what about you know? So in the lab, in terms of research, where are things now? So we have to go back to um, slightly um, less intelligent um,、uh, animal that we're somehow allowed to do a little bit more with,、um, and this is a courtesy of Dr. Andrew Schwartz from the University of Pittsburgh.、Um, as you can see, we have actually、um, this monkey has electrodes in the brain, and that signal is processed and then connected to the robotic arm. And this, as he was trained to move his own arm to reach for food, we recorded. He's actually my collaborator, so I'm using the word "we" freely, but it's they、um, have recorded the signals、um, as he was moving his own arm to reach for food. Then he, they strapped the arm down, so his arms are strapped under the sheets, and then he is using that signal to control the robotic device directly. And he just by thinking of moving his arm as he did for his own arm, he is able to control this robotic arm to get to where the food is. Now, one thing this is this is really really amazing. But one thing to note is that the hand motion, that's actually faked. Somebody sitting on here as a grad student is pressing a little remote control and opening and closing, because that level of detail we can't get yet. We can kind of get to the point where arm moves to a certain location where the food is. But beyond that, we can't actually get the food. Imagine if you had an arm but no hands, right? That's not so useful. You just get to something and says, "I can't reach. I can't do anything." So that's sort of where the technology is now. That's how much of the brain signals that we understand now. So really, moving forward, what can we do with this again amazing dexterity that we have? Well, I'll show you as we move forward in the human system. This is what we have as of today. So this is courtesy of、uh, Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago.、Um, he is a bilateral amputee. He lost both of the arms through um, through uh, electric um,、uh, electricity, and he was actually the first subject to receive what's called a muscle nerve、uh, reinnervation. So multi through multiple surgeries, 
the nerves that used to reach to his arms were rerouted to his chest muscles, and then tapping onto this mu the nerves, now and then connecting onto the robotic device, again, as he's thinking about moving his arms he used to have, we can get them, get them to move the robotic arm. Um, and there are about 70, maybe almost close to 20 subjects out there who look like this. Now, this is really neuro-robotics integration. This is exciting. But again, if you pay attention to the hand, they can just open and close. You know, it's getting more sophisticated. They might be able to move multiple joints at the same time, but not the hand. The hand, come on, you know, we can't, again, we can't just move the arm. So what's done in a prosthetic field, until recently also the funding was pretty limited. Recently because of the war, the unfortunate things sometimes bring a lot of money into the right area of research. And that has happened recently in a prosthetics area. Um, but most of the people are using still hooks, something that looks like hands but don't move at all, just because then they can feel like they're fitting into the normal society without being you know, looked at and they, people just whispering about how they look kind of funny. So, um, but beyond that, there are systems available that you can purchase, which are most of them are just open and closed based on some residual muscle signals they have. So if there are any stumps left over with muscle signals, they utilize that to open and close just one degree of freedom system. Uh, another system that's coming out can move maybe individual fingers separately. But suddenly, as the system might be able to move individual fingers, they're having a hard time deciding how to get that much level of information from the brain. Neuroscience is not quite there to get that information. Computer scientists are struggling to de sort of decipher the signals that are coming from the brain and getting to the point that a robotic system can understand. So um, that's sort of the brain side limitation, the neuroscience limitations right now that we're facing. But we'll tell you something more interesting in a second. For the robotic side, so another thing is that system itself seems kind of bulky still, while robotic people have been building hands for almost 25 years, maybe even 30 years, that looks a whole lot like human hands. So as, you know, those are researchers at Stanford and MIT who have built them. Um, those two are something I've built in the past. NASA has built something even 10 years ago, which is supposed to go on a space shuttle and repair things and then explore um, on different places which have human dexterity. Um, and the last few are all the efforts to, again, provide some dexterity to humans eventually as prosthetic devices. And they all have about five fingers. They all seem to have right kind of joints. And if you watch the videos online, they all seem to move a little bit like humans. So somehow there's a misconnection, right, that sort of the prosthetic knees are there, and the brain signals are coming through, and the robotic people have been making those things, but somehow they're not merging. And the real missing gap is that they're all kind of going in a somewhat wrong direction right now to really provide this dexterity. These robotic hands, no matter how much they try, they actually cannot um, reach the human the dexterity because the mechanical limitations have made them to build things maybe which have a rigid palm. Rigid palm allows you to put a lot of you know, electronics inside, but if you, have, you can't move your palm, you can't do very much. But engineers, I, I blame myself also, we just get all excited about five-finger system and we end up building and then we go, oh, maybe this is not human-like enough. So that's where robotic field is unfortunately at right now. So about seven years ago, I said, you know what, we're going to go all the way to the crazy extreme and we're going to start building anatomical system. So let's learn from the human biomechanics. Let's learn about you know, how much of this system is really useful to mimic in a robotic form. So we dissected human hands so that we can learn a whole lot more about information that doesn't exist in the literature. We built a version one of the system, which looks really like skeleton. We got together with the, sort of the animatronicists from Hollywood, uh, hand surgeons, and we built this system. And it worked great in a museum for six weeks until hand surgeons told me that this robotic system has developed arthritis. So um, turns out that humans, you know, we replace cells, you know, we sleep at night and when they, everything gets replaced, but robotic system, it just gets older and older and older and it just, get, just gets stuck and it doesn't move anymore. So that's unfortunately what happened. So over time, in the last six years or so, we've iterated and iterated and iterated until the robot no longer gets arthritis, but still preserving a lot of the anatomical features. And finally, we're at the point 
we have a nice, beautifully assembled system which mimics the shape of the bones, exactly where the muscles are arriving, and then the, how the muscles are connected through the tendons to the right point on the, on the robotic fingers. So now we actually have a system that can take exactly the same neural signals that you have in the brain and then put that right onto the robotic system. Also, by having the system, if we can't use this right away to the prosthetic system, at least we have a test bed that we can study a whole lot more about how human brain signals look like and which part of that would really allow the realization of dexterous movement in a robotic form. So I want to show you a video. Uh, this one first. So this is just to show you, I don't know if you've seen um, other robotic movements in the past, but this, is, this movement is controlled by the human finger, as you can see on the corner. And this is far more dexterous. It can move side to side, it can curl, it can move really fast. Um, it's, it's about as human-like as you're going to see or you have seen in the robotic system. Let's play the other video which shows you the sort of the feel of the whole robotic system and then a hand that's now um, uh, embedded onto the robotics, uh, the entire robotic arm. Here you go. So I, I'm sorry I couldn't bring the system. It's just it was too big and um, to bring it all the way here. So it's in a video form. It's sitting at the University of Washington. You can get a feel for how it's mounted on a robotic arm and the whole hand um, is mounted. And, but that's it, that's the whole system. And this is to show that you can just put little markers on the human finger to get, gather a lot of movement information. And then we can take that information and then simply move the robotic finger. So we can move this robotic finger through what we call kinematic information, so joint angle information. Or we can also control this from the muscle information. Or we can control this from the neural signal information. So now, if we can get this much dexterity and then can be controlled through the, the neural brain signals, we're getting closer and closer to the point that we can provide that dexterity that we're talking about for humans that we haven't been able to provide so far. Um, to conclude, I just wanted to sort of bring you up a few steps back up to say that Actually, this prosthetic work is something extremely exciting to us, but this is not just a very small part of what neurobotics field is all about. So other fields that we have um, is called exoskeleton. You might have heard of this even from the military sense. So the idea is not to for the people who are missing limbs, but people who have limbs. We can, can we provide wearable system that can augment the movement that they don't have? And in the military sense, they've already made a lot of progress on even enhancing our normal mobility. So robotic system, if you wear it for in the military case, they can now carry more weight and walk further than a normal, um, normal soldiers can. So those systems are now becoming more available. It's not nearly controlled, but it's a clever robotic system. We also use it not for assistive device, but as a rehabilitation. So people who had just had a stroke or traumatic brain injury, we can actually get them to sit in front of a robotic device, and the moment they grab onto this robotic system, robot can actually start to communicate in the neural signal sense. The robot can understand what the brain status is, and the, the robot can provide just the right kind of retraining, much sort of the improved physical therapy, as you might imagine. We can provide an environment like that. We can also have, have immersive environment for people who are missing sensory information, all the way to something maybe you, can, you like to have, right? You go to the golf club and then and you like to say, I wonder what my brain was doing to hit this crappy shot just now. You know, maybe we are developing systems that can track those motions and you can go home and analyze those motions. Um, and then finally, some system that really integrates the brain neurons, tissues, onto the silicon electronic system, really coming up with a nice neurobotics interface. So, that's, you know, that's a good feel of how the whole field of neurobotics look like. So utilizing the fact that um, this neurobotics field is now getting a lot more attention, and um, what another, another thing that uh, we are really trying to do is that suddenly engineering field is helping people. And this field didn't exist as much, in, especially in the field of robotics. So finally, we're kind of getting a new 
generation of engineers and scientists from high school who are just entering and then learning that and maybe science doesn't have to be so hard. So I would love to, you know, sort of really keep changing the image of engineering and science in such a way that we get different kind of people. And if we can get the message out further and further through the field of neurobotics, that would be really exciting. So thank you very much.